so people are on it, just not loading on my Safari or Chrome. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you guys are in the chat, let us know. And if you are a student in my class or not, let us know. You non-students are perfectly welcome since we put this up for everyone. Lots of behind the scenes, technical, interesting things. We need to give a few minutes for all of the students to make their way to this link. It's been so much fun to figure out technology, right, Adam? Oh, it's a land, not landfill, minefield. Minefield, yes. yes. It seems like a new thing every week that... That goes wrong? I'm, yes. Yes. Mm. So sound is back on, people are here. Great. Um, uh, so we'll just give a minute or two uh, for my students to all get the link from um, Isaac to make sure that they know where we are, um, and then we'll launch into it. So. And you've sent that link to Isaac, and he's sending it, Isaac, he's sending it to the students. Great. Uh, people also put it on Learning Suite. So okay. It's being spread around. It's being spread around, so everybody's getting it. Um, all right, we will, we will go ahead and start. Um, I should have my phone so I know what time it is. Sorry, I'm going off scam camera for a sec. So I can keep track of this. Oh, only seven minutes late, not too bad. Um, all right, let's begin. We are going to be doing the publishing lecture today. We're going to do two of these. Next week, we will cover indie publishing. And this week, we are going to be focusing mostly on traditional publishing. Uh, this is going to be a bit of a fire hose lecture. I apologize for that. I'm going to throw a lot of information at you. But the good thing is it's up on YouTube, so you can watch it again later if, uh, if some of this is too much for you. Uh, the way I'm going to format this lecture is I'm going to step you through how a book is created and explain all the different kind of behind the scenes people who are involved in it. Uh, we should talk, we'll be talking about agents, we'll be talking about marketing yourself to publishers, and that sort of thing. So lots of whiteboard this week. So let's start with the publisher. So the publisher on a book um, is usually somebody who has started what we call, or is running what we call an imprint. Back in the day, uh, 60, 70 years ago, these were all independent publishers. Um, they would start up a business, usually named after themselves, um, and they would be acquiring books and publishing. These days, almost all of these are owned by five, the big five publishers. Um, though there are some very large book companies that are not part of that. For instance, Scholastic is not part of the big five, um, and they are a very large publisher. But generally, everything is under a big, one of the big publishers, and a lot of these imprints are many little shall we say, cities in the publishing empire. So in a big company like Macmillan, which is one of my publishers, there is an imprint called Tor Books, which was founded by Tom Doherty back in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, was run as a separate independent publisher for a while and then acquired by Macmillan in the 90s. Tom Doherty is still the publisher of that imprint at Tor. A publisher is primarily a business person. Um, and they have several people underneath them that you probably should know about. They have what's called an editorial director. They have editors. And they have acquisitions editors. Um, and there's also sometimes uh, VPs or... Um, you know, uh, assistant publishers, different types of names. Uh, so what is this doing? S basically, your publisher's job is to handle the business side of things, and the editor's job is to handle editorial. The editor's job is to acquire books for the publisher to publish. 
Now, what you should understand is that these roles are often held by, um, not held by separate individuals, depending on the company. For instance, at Tor for many years, Tom Doherty was also the editorial director. Uh, Harriet McDougal was the editorial director at first. She retired, became Robert Jordan's editor only and his wife. And Tom Doherty basically became the editorial director. An editorial director's job is to oversee the editors to make sure that they are doing their jobs, basically middle management in charge of editors. An editor's job is to work with an author in ways we'll explain later, to take the book, to make it better, to perfect it, um, and kind of be basically a project manager. Um, sorry, barely read that. Uh, editor's kind of like a project manager. Their job is to oversee each project, which is a book. And an acquisitions editor is somebody who reads through what we call the slush pile. Slush pile is all of the submissions that have been sent in to the publisher, the people who want their books to be published. Um, and the acquisitions editor reads through them and finds books that they want to publish. Now, at Tor, for example, and at a lot of companies, these are not two separate jobs much of the time. Indeed, a lot of times the editor is the acquisitions editor or the editor has an assistant um, whose job is to help them with all of their work and will also act as a partial acquisitions editor for them in that the assistant will not be acquiring themselves. They'll just be looking for promising manuscripts to give to the editor that the editor might want to acquire. My editor at Tor, Tor Moshe Fader, was the assistant to another editor for many years, helped him with uh, acquiring books and with editing them, and then eventually was told, you are allowed to now acquire for yourself. And then Moshe went out and started to look for authors to acquire for himself and moved up into being an editor. Um, so this is just useful to know about the publishers you're submitting to, um, to know which imprint has who is their publisher. At Random House, which publishes my teen books, um, we have a basically editorial director slash publisher all wrapped up in one who is not the head publisher but is in charge of a small group of editors. Her name is Beverly and she doesn't acquire, she just manages these editors. Normally the people in this position are going to do much less acquisitions, in fact they may not do any. Once in a blue moon, a friend of Tom's would want to publish a book and Tom would, would read it himself and be like, you know what, I really like this, it fits Tor. He would then assign it to one of his editors and say, you become the editor on this project. Um, I don't believe that Beverly over at, um, at um, Random House, uh, Delacorte is the imprint there that I publish with, does any acquisition herself. She just oversees everyone else. Once in a while, an editorial director will have their own line of books they're publishing while they're overseeing everyone else. In fact, that was the case with Harriet at Tor before she um, retired from that position. So it's useful to know because this will influence who you're sending your books to, who you are targeting, and who you want to buy them. Um, for instance, at Tor, Approaching Tom Doherty directly is probably not going to work for you. Like I said, once in a while, one of his friends or someone he knows or some, some contact will make him say, you know what, I'm going to acquire this book. But most of the time at Tor, you're going to be looking for directly at the editors um, and trying to pitch your books to them. How do you do that? Well, this takes us into kind of phase two. This um, over here will talk about how books get to these people. And they come through two general format uh, avenues. One is agents, and one is direct. Um, over the years, that is a really weird way to write direct, Brennan. Um, over the years, publishing has moved less direct and more agented. This has been a continual trend that began decades ago um, and is still a continuing trend that more and more publishers are saying on their submission guidelines that they do not take unagented submissions. Uh, the big shift in this, as I understand, happened really in the 80s and 90s um, <coughs> where agents started to shoulder more of the burden of reading slush and picking out the gems and sending those directly to the editors. Um, this is how most books, I would say these days, are sold traditionally, is that an author picks up an agent, 
The agent then takes it to all the editors in town, pitches the book to them, uh, picks and uh, gets offers back, goes back to the author and says, here's our offers. Uh, what do you want to do in these sorts of things? Direct still happens. I sold direct. Um, I sold a, a launchress to Tor Books in 2003 through a submission directly to an editor that I had met at a convention. That was Moshe. Um, instead of having an agent. I was submitting to agents at the same time, but I sold directly. Now, one of the questions that arises a lot regarding this is, should I be hunting an agent? Should I be going direct? Um, as I said, direct is actually getting harder and harder to do. Most agents will say to you, and most editors probably as well will say, your best bet is to hunt an agent first. Don't submit the book to editors directly. The reason they say this is because if an agent picks up a book, then finds out you've actually submitted it to every editor already and they've rejected it, that agent will feel like this book has already gone through the town and is therefore um, soiled goods? I don't know. It's like they can't sell this book. That's the fear that they have. Um, I will tell you uh, a contrasting opinion to that. I think that that opinion is wise and valid. Um, there is an argument for sending directly to editors. Um, I might be survivorship biasing this one because it worked for me, but my argument to myself was always, I might as well double the number of places I can send books to. And if it turns out that an agent picks up a book that I've already sent out a bunch, well, then they will have better avenues for selling that and get the, um, get the editors to take another look at it. Or I will just give them a new book because I write quickly enough that if they feel like this book has already seen the town, well then, if they're willing to pick up one of my books, there's a decent chance because I write so much, they will like the other ones as well. In fact, an agent is not looking for a book, they're looking for an author. Uh, agents generally want to represent um, an author during the early part of their career um, and then reap benefits later. In fact, this whole industry for most of its life has been focused on this idea. The idea that a new author is a money losing proposition in most cases for a publisher. Uh, a brand new author takes time to launch. A brand new author's first books are generally not going to sell a ton of copies, and it's over time with that author establishing a fan base um, that becomes, and that author becoming popular, that is what they are looking for. Um, so, in general, through the course of history, that's what they wanted, and I'm a good example of that. Uh, Elantra sold fine, it did just fine, but it wasn't uh, probably even paying the bills for Tor in the long run. But Mistborn, the whole trilogy, ended up selling better, and then The Way of Kings ended up doing even better, and suddenly I am one of their best-selling authors. In fact, I think I might be Tor's best-selling author. Um, and because of this, now those books are extremely profitable for Tor, when early they lost money on me. So, in an ideal world, everyone is looking for authors to build up over time. The unfortunate part about this is, over the years, this has become less of a theme and it's become more bestseller driven. What do I mean by bestseller driven? So for a long for for most of entertainment, let's just say this, in most of entertainment, the the pieces of media that do highly uh, successful business pay for all the risks you take on ones that don't sell as well. And then you will have something in the middle called the midlist in books. A midlist book is a book that makes money for the publisher, pays for itself, but doesn't make so much that it's really funding anything else. Uh, these are successful books by career authors who have a dedicated fan, fan base, but not a huge one. These people were very important to publishing for many, many, many years because them in aggregate would be as much money to the publisher as their few headliners of which they'd only have a couple. And so maintaining a really strong midlist was a very important part of the business. Um, however, some things have happened. One is indie publishing. And indie publishing has begun to bite in, out that midlist quite a bit, take big chunks out of it. Uh, because generally, if you're a midlist author, it is more profitable for you to independently publish than it is to publish with a publisher. Um, this is because all of, if you have 
a small, consistent fan base that is not growing, but is also not shrinking, then, and they are willing to buy every book you put out, you don't need marketing budgets. You don't need huge marketing campaigns. You can directly target that audience yourself and you can sell to them and you will make a much better cut of the money doing that. And because of that, a bunch of people who would be mislisters are now indie publishing. Um, because of that, publishing has said, well, we need to focus more on the hits. We need more hits. The other thing that happened that caused this is some consolidation in the book industry. Um, when a lot of the small bookstores folded and the large conglomerate chains took over, which was a big process happening through the 80s and 90s and into the 2000s, what happened is a lot of niche bookstores that were very good sellers for Midlist vanished. For instance, there would be bookstores in the past. Um, Tom Doherty tells the story of, it's not even a bookstore. It's like the corner store, the truck stop, uh, let's say. He often uses this one. So the truck stop exists, and in that truck stop, there are a bunch of truckers that come through who really like Westerns. And Tom Doherty could publish a few Midlist Western books, and he could get those into those truck stops, and his bulk of his audience was these truckers who would buy them. Well, during the 90s, what happened is books started to consolidate into only the big bookstores. And the truck stops stopped being able to sell as many books um, because people were going to Barnes and Nobles and things. Um, and what was happening is that some of these niche markets were drying up. Uh, the distributors, were, it wasn't worth their money to go to all these little chains anymore and put these books in because it was just so much overhead to hire all those, um, those people that even though there was an audience for those books, those books were no longer profitable or as profitable as sending them all to the big corner bookstore, which then was going to be more hit driven. Um, plus, a lot of your market started getting picked up by places like Costco um, and uh, things like this, where you weren't selling niche books, you were selling very hit driven books. Someone going to Costco is looking for the new Dan Brown book. They are not looking for the new niche Western book that a lot of truckers might like, but it's a small enough segment that it's just not profitable. Um, I could go into this for hours. Trust me, I'm just giving you a summary. I'm getting some details wrong on this, but the end result was the publishers feeling they needed to be more hit driven. And so they started to focus on, let's buy a book, see if it explodes big. If it doesn't explode big, we drop that author and put another author in that slot because the book that hasn't come out yet has that chance of being really huge. Very rare chance, but it has a chance. Once an author is a known quantity, there's this sense that a midlister will re remain a midlister and that there are some upper echelons that are like, cut those midlisters, let's look for more hits. This is fallacious. Um, you may be saying, wait a minute, do midlisters never become bestsellers? George R. R. Martin was a quintessential midlister all through the 70s and 80s and became the biggest epic fantasy writer in the business in the 90s and the 2000s. Great example of someone who had a long uh, career with some dedicated fans and then wrote a book that just connected with everybody and it spread from those fans like wildfire to the rest of the world. So, um, I think, you know, personally, in the long run, this old method is still better for writers, readers, and authors, but that is not necessarily how some executives think about it. So be warned, hit-driven is kind of a thing. Now, let's go back to this sort of thing, and let's talk a little bit about agents for you. Um, and then we'll talk about direct uh, publishing yourself. And this is going to answer some of your questions that are popping up. So, what is an agent? Um, agents um, are people who, let's say, um, in Hollywood, agents have this kind of reputation um, where, you know, maybe this whole sliminess reputation and things. Um, in New York, book agents generally have a very good reputation. Um, I rarely hear authors speak ill of their agent, and if they do, it's a relationship that's on the rocks, and the author generally leaves that agent and goes to someone else. Um, agents tend to be very good at 
um, being their author's advocate in the business. Um, and so I really like my agent. Um, I think highly of him. I think highly of agents in general. I will give you the counter argument to agents in a minute here, but let's talk about what agents do. So, an agent's um, pro, you know what? Let's, let's do direct for a minute. It'll explain better if I talk about direct. So, um, to publish direct, sorry for that lane change here, um, to publish direct with a publisher, for many years and still viable, what you would do is you would take a full and completed novel. You're not selling on proposal in fiction. Nonfiction, you can often sell on proposal. In nonfiction, let's say you are a person who has lived their life as a, in a specialist career. You are, um, you are a rock star, or you are somebody who knows a ton about weight loss or things like this. You can rely on your credentials and an outline to say, well, I'm gonna write an, um, a how-to book on this. You can sell on proposal. Does not happen in publishing by new authors. Um, an established author can sell on proposal and usually will. You won't yet. You need a completed novel, all right? So you take your completed novel and you will then start sending it out um, via query letter. So stage number one is query. U-U-E-R-R-Y, I think. Um, a query is a one-page synopsis of your book. Um, usually the format follows this sort of, um, you know, paragraph about the book, little paragraph about yourself, and uh, talking about, um, at the end, uh, asking that they review the book and uh, ask if they're interested. I am terrible at queries, so I'm going to refer you to lots of resources online about how to write a good query. Uh, Google it. There are people who are way better at it than I am. I was always terrible at queries. I still don't really um, think that I'm good at queries. When I asked my agent what made a good query, he basically said, credentials, basic premise, some sort of hook, few rhetorical questions, uh, meaning stay away from the what would happen in a world. He doesn't like those, that's personal to him, um, but just kind of the, the, the premise in short. This is a heist novel about a group of thieves who want to rob the Dark Lord of the world after the prophesied, prophesied hero failed to bring the Dark Lord down. Uh, there's your, your kind of hook sentence for Mistborn. A little bit about myself um, would follow, particularly if you have credentials, if you publish short stories or things like this. Um, and then following a little bit longer uh, sort of summary about the book, hitting only maybe one or two key elements that make it really interesting. Um, potentially some comps saying, if I were trying this right now, I'd say it has a feel a little bit like Scott Lynch's um, um, uh, series. Um, don't say it's Harry Potter meet Lord of the Ring. Actually do like a real comp and then get out. But I'm going to refer you to other people uh, to explain to you how to write a good query. Usually you will send them a query. Then those queries uh, that you send out a small, small percentage of the editors will write back and ask for sample chapters. In all the years I was doing this, I got one response to a query asking for sample chapters out of dozens upon dozens that I sent out. Um, that was to Joshua, my, the person who eventually became my agent. He didn't pick me up before I sold my book somewhere else, but he did pick me up after. If they like the sample chapters, they, are, they will request a full manuscript. All right. They will then read the full manuscript. And if they like it, they will then make an offer. This is the way the process is supposed to go. Um, I don't know how often it actually goes like this. Uh, you'd have to ask an editor how often. I did remember reading an editor once saying, out of every 100 queries they got, they asked for sample chapters on about 10. Out of every uh, 10 sample chapters, they asked on a full manuscript on about one. And at about of every 10 full manuscripts they got, they made an offer on one. That seemed like a pretty too even a number of percentage split down to be realistic, but uh, there's at least one look at it. Um, now, this might seem soul crushing to you. It certainly did to me when I was trying to break in because the odds of getting through all of this seem really low. 
there are a few things that improve your odds, particularly once you get to this uh, stage. Um, most people who want to publish books do not know what they're doing. Most people are, um, have not actually written a lot. They have written one novel. They may not have even finished it despite submitting it. They have not watched lectures on this. Um, and most people, their books can get dismissed very quickly based on the sample chapters. Um, queries, I don't know. I hate queries, if you can't tell. Um, but it seems like the same way. One of the, the ostensibly the reasons for query is that the agents will take all the books that are written by people who seem professional. That was not my, my experience, but that's what they say. Your mileage may value, or may vary. Um, but my, one of my goals was always to skip the query stage. After sending out all those queries on, you know, books I knew were pretty good. In fact, uh, Launchers was included in that. Um, and getting no, uh, no answers, I started to figure, can I somehow jump to the sample chapter stage? Uh, because once they're rejecting me on sample chapters, at least they're rejecting me on my prose and my storytelling not on my ability to write a summary and a good business letter. Um, the way that I went about this is by trying to meet the editors directly, uh, going to conventions, uh, listening to them at conferences, um, trying to read what they write online about books and things like this, and trying to ask them directly, hey, I've got a book that I think would really match you. Would you be willing to take a look at it? And almost every time, that I asked someone in person, they said, yeah, send me sample chapters, which skipped this step for me. Again, your mileage may value. I don't know how many um, editors these days, this was 20 years ago that I was doing this, how many editors these days are willing to look at unagented submissions at all. Uh, I still know that if you go to con conferences, that a lot of times editors at conferences will ask for sample chapters. By the way, this is also the process by which you get an agent. Um, the same sort of query, sample chapters, full manuscript offer um, is, is almost exactly the same process for picking up an agent. Um, and agents go to conferences um, and conventions as well. So how do you meet these people? Um, well, one of the methods is this conference method. Um, this conference method is that uh, by the way, I will split conventions and conferences into two part, into two things. When I say a convention, I mean something like World Fantasy Convention, World Horror Convention, World Con. These are fan-run conventions that are not professionally focused. World Fantasy tends to be the most professionally focused of those, but basically they're not for profit. They are gatherings of authors who, and agents and editors who get together to talk about the business and about writing, or in the case of Worldcon, to talk about who's the best Star Trek captain. Um, and editors happen to be there, and they are working, and you can hear them on panels, and you can bitch to them. Conferences are different. This is like, locally, we have one called Writers for Young Readers. Um, conferences tend to be, you pay a larger ticket price to get in, an editor or an agent often is a guest brought in. There are pitch sessions with them. Professional offers are often, um, you're, part of what you're paying for is critiques from professional authors. And a lot of writers' conferences fall into this category. These are ways to network both with uh, um, authors around your writing skill level or professional level and to meet editors and agents. It's still very hard. Um, it is very difficult and it is still a little soul crushing. Uh, I understand that, uh, but this is a method that you can use. You can also follow these editors and agents on Twitter or on Facebook or things like this. See what they're saying. You can at least put into your query letters um, some personalized information. I would recommend if you're going this, this route, imagine two different query letters, right? So we imagine query letter from author A. And author A says, dear acquisitions editor, I would like you to read my book, such and such. It's really great, here is why. Thank you for your consideration. Perfectly professional, well-written query letter. Imagine you get another query letter that says, dear, put in the actual name of the editor, say, dear Moshe Fader, um, I am a big fan of Brandon Sanderson's work and I know you are his editor. I've been following the other authors you've released lately, including this one and this one, and think your editorial eye is very sharp and indeed, I feel like 
the writing that I um, write matches what you might enjoy because I like, for instance, very intricate magic systems that are easy to understand and a focus on characters' interaction with their setting. Uh, here is my book, such and such and such. I hope that you will give it consideration. That second query letter, if written well, is going to probably get a better chance of response than the first one. This requires you to do your research. You have to know who the editors are at the publisher and if they're acquiring or not. You have to know which authors they are editing and what books, particularly by new authors, that they've released recently. Um, you have to do a lot of legwork finding out all of this stuff because it's not easy to find. Generally, you're looking at acknowledgments pages of authors' books. You are Googling online. You're sometimes asking the author who their editor is, that sort of stuff, and whether they would recommend them. In my case, um, you probably do not want to submit to Moshe. Moshe takes very, very few books. He is a consulting editor at Tor. Um, I can't remember the last time he picked up a new author in these most recent years. He's mostly been editing me. So you would want to find someone at Tor who is probably newer and who is, um, who is acquiring a lot. That said, Moshe is a fantastic editor. If by some luck you do end up with Moshe, um, he, uh, he is a really, really good editor. Um, so you have to do all this work, and it is a ton of work. Uh, we talk about you know people having a little black book of you know all these 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 people of um, that they are interested in dating and all their phone numbers and information. You need a little black book that says here is the publisher of this imprint. Here is the are the editors at this imprint who are acquiring. Here are books they've released in the last couple of years that they acquired by new authors, and read those books and start to get a sense for it. That sounds like a lot of work. One of the re things that agents do now going back over here. The pros of agents, uh, what they're going to do is they do all that legwork. Their, one of their primary jobs is to know in person all of the different editors at all of the different publishers and the books that they have released recently and things they've said about what they're looking for. By the way, never ask an editor what they're looking for. Quick tip. Ask them what they bought recently. If you ask what they're looking for, they won't want to pigeonhole themselves because they wouldn't want to exclude a book that they don't know they're looking for yet that is really fantastic. So they all hate that question. But if you say, what's the most recent book that you acquired by a brand new author and why did you acquire it? Much better question to ask an editor. Gets them talking about what made them pick up this book and, and that sort of thing. And granted, you don't always want to send an editor the exact thing they've just acquired because they just acquired that, so they won't need another book just like that. But it can be really handy uh, to get a, a feel for what uh, the, the editor likes editorially. All right? So agents do all that legwork. They are going to lunch with these editors. They are meeting them at you know, cocktail parties. They are keeping lists of who's bought what recently, all of that stuff. An agent is also a negotiator. Um, when you get that offer from a publisher, the agent is an expert in contracts, uh, specifically publishing contracts. They will know what's, um, what should be in a contract. And I should put in here contracts. They will know what you can argue for and what you can't argue for as a new author, or at least how hard it is to argue for things. You can ask for anything, anything you can argue for, but what you're likely to get, they'll know. Um, they will know your worth as an author because they will know, you know, editor or publishers need books. If this is all like, why wow, this is so hard, understand you have something they want. Even though you're a brand new author, they need books to publish. They can't rely on Brandon Sanderson forever because Brandon Sanderson is eventually not going to have books for them anymore. Hopefully not for many, many years, but they know this. They need what you have. So you have innate value to the publisher. And the agents will know how to exploit that value to its fullest extent to negotiate for the best deal. Um, they also can offer editorial. An agent, a good agent, often knows how to help an author make a book work better for the, um, for the uh, editors and can do kind of a first editorial pass to fix things that might turn editors off at the beginning and help them want to pick up the book. So with all of these things, why would you not want an agent? Well, let's talk about the cons. 
not conventions, but cons of having agents. Uh, number one is they take 15%. They take 15% of the off the top of every contract. In fact, the way that most of the business is done, the, um, uh, the publisher sends money to the agent who takes 15% out and sends the rest to you. Now, this can be a slight advantage in consolidation. Um, of I O N of um, your money. For instance, at the end of the year, I get from my agent a summary of everything we've gotten, um, and basically a 1099 from them saying, "Here is all the money that we have paid to you in one easy uh, form for taxes." But this can also be a con. Some once in a while doesn't happen often. But once in a while, an agent is corrupt. And it has happened that authors have been not paying attention to what their actual in money in was, and agents were taking more than they should. Uh, again, very rare, but there are some people who don't like agents that say, if you do get an agent, make the money be split at the publisher and not at the agent. The publisher sends 15% of the agent and 85% uh, to you. Uh, full disclosure, I do not do this. It sounds like a huge hassle for the publisher, and um, I do trust my agent. but. This is a legitimate uh, concern about agents and one reason that people do not like agents. Um, another reason that people don't like agents is they do not want editorial. Uh, as agents have become more and more the slush pile that publishers are, or that people are submitting to and that they are then sending on to editors, sometimes there is this conflict of interests where the agent feels like they don't want to submit anything but the best work they can find so that those editors will always be trusting that this agent only submits the most high quality work and therefore the agent uh, you know, goes to the top of the slush pile. Because of this, agents will sometimes run uh, authors through many revisions on a book looking to get it uh, editorially just as the agent wants it and then some people, uh, and I think this is a very legitimate concern, um, who don't like agents will say, that's not the agent's job. The agent's job is to sell the book. The agent's job is not to be the editor of the book. And if an agent is holding a book back from submitting it because they want it to be something it's not, then that's dangerous because what if the agent's opinion is wrong, they have it revised all this other direction, and the editors would have liked it better if it just would have been submitted, some people say, just submit the book, don't go editorial. You're gonna have to decide for yourself, if you go traditionally, pu traditionally published, how much editorial you want from an agent and how much you're willing to take from an agent. Some agents, for instance, will not pick up an author uh, until they've gone through a couple of rounds of revision with every author to see if the author is willing to revise and is good at it. Some authors, that's just not what they look for in an agent. So. Uh, be aware of that, and there is this um, sometimes other conflicts of interest. Uh, for instance, um, let's say an agent could spend an extra couple of weeks negotiating on your contract and bring it up from getting $10,000 in advance to, say, $20,000. And that agent looks at that and says, my 15% on an hourly basis of the amount of work I would have to do to get this from $10,000 to $20,000 is just not worth that hourly rate. I should just tell the author to take the 10 grand. Whereas for you, 10 grand to 20 grand as an advance could be the dividing line between you being able to go full time at this or not. So sometimes there's this conflict of interest with agents, and good agents will acknowledge this and we'll kind of have a blanket. Our job is to get the best deal for our author regardless of how much time it takes as long as the author wants to keep pushing because otherwise we run into conflict of interest um, levels. Um, and this is why um, I base a lot of what I think a good agent does on what Joshua does. Uh, Joshua is willing to spend months negotiating a contract for $500 for foreign rights on a book because it's kind of a matter of principle that he doesn't violate, that he is always looking for the best deal for the author because to not be looking for the best deal of the author leads you down this path of, um, of madness. So um, 
pretty legitimate gripes that people don't like about agents. A lot of indie published people do not use agents at all. If they do use agents, they use them for another con uh, bonus that agents have, which is overseas. Overseas sales are very hard for you to sell on your own. Uh, most indie authors I know do not sell overseas and in translation. Usually, that is the agent's job. The agent will take your book and will have deals with a lot of agents in other countries, and they, these agents in other countries will be already have a deal that anything the US agent picks up the agent, say, in France is going to accept as a client and try to sell in France. Um, this can be really good money, uh, particularly new as a new author. Uh, one of the advantages we have in writing in the English language is that English language entertainment is generally the entertainment leader worldwide. Uh, just like French wine or uh, you know, German or Japanese cars have a reputation, um, English language entertainment has a reputation for being very high quality. And we benefit from that in that um, a lot of our books are able to be sold in many different countries for sometimes small deals, but in aggregate make quite a bit of money for us. Um, this isn't to say that other countries don't have really vibrant and uh, great local publishing um, enterprises of their own. A lot of them do. Um, but this is an advantage we have. Plus, the English language market is just so big that starting English language and going to smaller markets generally makes a lot of sense because if you are, for instance, are writing first language and you're writing um, in a language where there just aren't a lot of book sales, then your advances will be so small that you can't live on it. But if you're English language and then picking up extra money from other sales, uh, it, can be, it can work much better. So regardless, your agents, one of their jobs will be to sell these books overseas. Um, and even before my first book came out, Joshua had three deals for me overseas before the book was published. Um, and this is just a thing that agents tend to be very good at because it also makes a lot of sense for them to have their authors all around the world. So let's go ahead um, and talk about some of the questions that we have here regarding agents and up until this point. All right. So and then we will dig into what happens when a book actually gets an offer on it. Okay. So uh, when do you give up on finding an agent? Um, only when you decide that you want to go indie published. As long as you want to be traditionally published, you should be looking at getting an agent. Um, if you have <coughs> these problems, that would be another reason to not get an agent. You should not give up on an agent because of rejections. You should give up on an agent because you legitimately have problems with these sorts of things and don't think you want to use an agent. Uh, it is still possible, very hard, but still possible to do. And there are some indie authors who use an agent only for overseas contracts or, or things like that. Um, or you have decided to indie publish, which we'll talk about next week. Uh, there is a good argument for being what we call a hybrid author, which is an author who's open to both avenues. Um, and I will talk about being a hybrid author next week as well. All right. So uh, should agents be approached with complete books? Yes. Um, we already kind of covered that one. What can a mid-lister expect salary-wise? <clears throat> so a mid-lister in general is someone that I would consider um, who is earning a part-time living at their, money, at their writing. For instance, they are making you know, 10 to 20 grand all the way up to somebody who's making 70 to 100 grand. That's still mid-lister money. Um, this is hard to talk about and give you an expectation for because your earnings will be directly tied to how many books you sell, right? And what, is, what counts as a mid-lister? How many books count as a mid-lister? This really depends on a lot of factors, and I'll try to dig into this in a, in a few minutes, okay? Um, when is a manuscript good enough to submit to an agent? First, second, third? Um, I would recommend third draft is where you start. This is going to be very individual to you. But I recommend it. finish the book, put it aside, come back to it in six months, do a solid revision of it. Get a bunch of early readers, do a third draft, incorporating what comments you think that they make that is good, and then start submitting it. Um, as you practice revision, you may get better at doing drafts in the future. And as it's out for submission, you may want to sit, solicit another group of readers. Um, they can help you revise that book and make it better. 
but uh, there's no one answer, but there's, there's a, a quick one for you. How hard is it to get a publisher to pick up a book after it's been indie published? Uh, it really depends at that point on your success as an indie author. Um, uh, it's been a while, so ask some editors directly. But for a while, man managing to sell 10 to 20,000 copies on your own was where the uh, publishers started to sit up and take notice. Um, it depends on the price point too, right? If your book is being read mostly as part of the, 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 the Kindle, whatever it is, the, um, where you pay a monthly fee and you can read as many of the, the books that are in that, uh, in that um, group that you want, that's not gonna be as interesting. If you're selling your book at, one, at 99 cents and you sell 20,000, that's different than if you sell your book at 399 and you sell 20,000. I don't have the hard numbers for you. I would ask around on this to people who've done it. See, one of the problems you have with me is it's now been 20 years since I broke in. Um, and so my information, though I try to keep very up to date, is just not gonna be as good as people who are selling right now and breaking in right now, or who are into pu indie publishing right now. In fact, I'm going to, hopefully, hopefully you guys are watching, Jen and Becky are going to give me um, their uh, notes on indie publishing. These are two indie published authors who are in the class right now. Um, and they were gonna teach you next week the indie publish lesson, but because of this whole having to go from houses and things like that in quarantine, I'm going to still teach it. Um, I do know a decent amount about it, and hopefully they will be sending me their notes through that I can use uh, to kind of understand how it's going right now. Um, but yeah. Um, is there a magazine website we can follow that would have this type of publishing industry information? There are a bunch of different places. Um, again, I'm not the best at tracking this anymore. Uh, for a long time, the absolute right Forums uh, called the Absolute Right Water Cooler was the place to go to find out about publishers and who the editors were and things like that. I don't know if it's still up and running. Um, there are lots of resources for queries online that people talk about. Uh, there are Publishers Weekly um, often will list deals people make, but you have to belong to their subscription service to see those deals. So um, really, this is something that um, also is gonna vary widely depending on your genre. Um, I'll try to give you a rundown either this week or next week of all of the big five publishers in uh, sci-fi fantasy that you can then start to use as a guide um, for going out and finding these things. But I don't even know all the editors at Tor anymore uh, because editors do tend to change and Tor's gone through some big revolutions lately. And so I barely know the names of anybody at any of the publishers because now these days, that's what, what my agent's job was. Back in 2000, when I was trying to break in, I knew there were all of their names and I had them all written down. I just don't keep track of that anymore. Um, it's, it's too much work to do when I don't have to do it, if that makes sense. I apologize for that. Um, do agents, editors often give feedback or a reason for declining a book, or is it radio silence? So that's a great question. Generally, it's radio silence if you get rejected on query, um, and half or more of the time if you get rejected on sample chapters. Some of the time, you will get feedback on sample chapters. We'll say, this is why we rejected it. Every time I had a full manuscript reje get rejected, I got full, I got feedback explaining why. Um, if they're taking the effort to go through a full manuscript um, and read through it, they generally are giving you feedback. Uh, so it depends. Once you start getting personalized feedback, it's a really good sign that you're getting close. Uh, about a year before I broke in, I started getting a lot of personalized feedback on my rejection letters. That was a very good sign uh, to me. Granted, most of these were things that had skipped the query stage, um, but yeah. Um, all right. Um, what are some warning signs? We'll end with this one on this Q&A part uh, that you should look out for with agents. It's a really good question because um, there, while there are certain kind of professional groups that collect agents that agents can belong to, um, bad agents belong to, the, uh, to these group professional organizations and good agents, there are some that don't belong. So the professional organizations are not a one-to-one -one correlation on a good agent. What you should be looking out for is this agent, if you're going with this agent, they should work at an agency that has sold books by new authors recently that you can find in bookstores, okay? The big danger that you're looking out for is someone who calls themselves an agent and then is soliciting all of these things and then is funneling your books toward uh, what we call vanity presses. Vanity presses are this segment of the book publishing industry that exists 
to charge you money to publish your books. This is different from indie publishing. In indie publishing, you're in control, and you may pay for an editor. You may pay for a, uh, for a cover. In fact, you should do both of those things. Um, and that is legit. That's what you should be doing. A lot of these kind of vanity presses, they'll act like they're a traditional publisher. Some bad agents will exist simply to funnel people into them. They'll say, good news, we've accepted your book. All we need is $5,000 in order to publish your book. These are people you should run away from full speed. An agent who sends to any of these places is not a legitimate agent, um, or at least is a, is a legitimate agent with huge um, ethical problems going on. Um, and these publishers are not people that can do what you want them to do. There are a very, very small number of people that Vanity Presses actually serve legitimately, in my opinion. And this is someone who has a book that they want to publish, so they have lots of copies of it to give to their friends and family, but who is not looking to make a career out of publishing. Um, the, there is a small chance that also a celebrity who does their book and wants to sell it like, like let's say you are a rock star and you want to have a book for sale at your, um, at your concerts to sell with like your CDs and things like that. Vandy Publisher probably is a decent um, uh, option for you. But in most of these cases, indie publishing, the book on your own, can be done print on demand, so you can order as many copies as you want to sell yourself. They'll be at a very high price point. You won't make a lot of money off of those print copies. But the ebook copies, you will be able to make money off of. There is no reason to go with a vanity press. From the majority of people, you should just in in investigate indie publishing, which again, you will have to pay for, but you do not need one of these vanity publishers. Um, and so stay far away. If you want to read more on them, uh, there is a website that for a long time was maintained, I don't know if it is anymore, called Writer Beware, which was maintained by SIFWA, uh, the Science Fiction Writers Association of America, where they would list a lot of things about why vanity press presses were just not recommended. A um, lot of them have, um, have died off in the era of indie publishing. There's still a bunch of them around, but a lot of them have died off. Uh, another warning sign is an agent who is asking for eternal revisions on your things without actually sending them out. An agent who says you've, they put your book out on submission but isn't willing to actually sit, tell you the names of the editors they submitted to, which imprints they're at, and is not willing to send you the um, rejection letters, that's a warning sign. They should be willing to do all of this stuff. An agent who asks for a lot of money up front, bad. The only thing an agent should ever charge you for is like sometimes postage, right? And even then, my agent never charges any money. He will take things out of what he sells. Like if he sends a bunch of books overseas, it's part of our contract that he can charge the postage of that to me, and that comes out of money that I've earned. It's never more than a couple of hundred bucks um, a, a pay period. Um, and it's just like really minuscule. And again, I'm never paying any money. It's coming out of other things. So watch out for agents that are asking for money. Watch out for agents that are asking for reading fees. Watch out for agents who, are, uh, who, aren't, who aren't publishing books, right? Who are, they don't publish, but you know what I mean. Who aren't selling books to legitimate publishers that you can find in the bookstore. Here's the bottom line. If this publisher or person you want to work with, if you can't go to Barnes & Noble and find their books on the shelf, not orderable, but on the shelf, you don't need them. You can do indie publishing, um, and you can do everything that those people would do for you on your own, and you probably should. If you can go and find a book by a new author picked up in the last couple of years on the shelves at Barnes & Noble, already there, not have to be ordered in, then chances are good that's a legitimate publisher slash um, agent, if they represented that, all right? Okay. Whew, how much time do we have left? Um, about 15 minutes. All right. So we are going to break down what uh, happens when a book gets acquired. All right. And I'm going to go fast through this part because we only have 15 minutes left because we got a bit of a, short, uh, a late start. So <coughs> the book gets acquired. This is great. What happens is first there's an offer. And this is usually of an advance. An advance from a publisher is money up front that is a loan against the money that book is going to earn for you over time. It is a loan that does not need to be paid back if the book does not earn enough money. It is a loan that needs to be paid back if you do not deliver the book or something like that happens, all right? 
and advance will be offered. Uh, usually advances for first time authors are around 10K. Uh, they range between five and 20 um, uh, K. But uh, last time I saw one of the polls that said, what did you get on your first book? It was around 10K. So this is $10,000 up front. It's a, even a, a little bit worse than that because usually this 10K is split between half on signing and half on publication. Um, which means that you're going to get 5K of that when you sign that contract. Uh, once in a while, it's one third on signing, one third on uh, turn in and acceptance of the book, and one third on publication. Sometimes it's even split by paperback. So there's a fourth one. One fourth on publication of hardcover, one fourth on paper publishing of paperback. I think that's where mine are now because my advances have gotten so astronomically huge that the publisher wants to space them out as far as possibly possible. Um, how high do advances get? Um, they can go all the way from here up to 10 million. Um, is about what you see the like the highest that you're seeing for anyone except for the really big kind of rule breaking authors like the, your JK Rowlings and stuff like that. Um, so it's anywhere in there. How do they know what to offer on a book if it's by a new author? Well, this is where, as my agent puts it, imaginary numbers come in, not the actual mathematical sense. But what will happen is the editor will go to the publisher and say, I really like this book. I think it's really good for our line. We should publish it. And the publisher, sometimes working with the marketing director and other people, depends on the, uh, on the, the publisher, um, the imprint, will get back and say, all right, how much do you think it can make? And the editor will say, I put this sheet together, it's called a P&L, Profit and Loss Sheet, that assumes this book does as well as this other book that we published by a new author that's kind of similar. And based on those imaginary numbers that we've made up, I think we can offer $20,000 on this book. And the publisher will be like, great, that's your negotiation, negotiating, that's like your high end. Um, you can start negotiations below. If they're demanding more than that, you need to come back and renegotiate with us. Sometimes, that imaginary number will be like, we've hit the zeitgeist. We can offer up to 100K on this, right? Or whatever. They, they just kind of decide. Now, how they know partially about this is if the book has been up for what we call a bidding war. This is if the agent gets a book that they think is really hot. They're like, wow, this is fantastic. This is by a new author. Everyone's going to want this. They will send it out to all the publishers. And instead of what normally happens when you submit, you submit to the uh, publisher. They, have, they take like six months to a year to review it and get back to you. It's this really miserable wait. It was 18 months I waited for launchers to come back to me. Um, instead, the agent will say, we're taking offers in two weeks. We, um, we expect this to sell really fast. And suddenly, everyone goes crazy like, wow. <coughs> this agent has a fantastic book. They all go read it. The agents, um, this is why agents try to keep a good reputation, because an agent who doesn't have a good reputation for books in the past can't get away with this as easily. They all read the book, and let's say they all like it. <clears throat> then they all get back, and they start making their offers, and then the agent goes back to them and says, well, these people offered 100K, and that's, you know, we don't, you know, you gotta have to beat that. And so this, uh, they'll kind of basically play them all off of each other and eventually arrive at <clears throat> a high number. Now, there's some interesting things about advances you should know. Because they are money that you are going to be paying back out of your royalties, it means that if your book sells the same number of copies that, um, that a famous author's book sells, you will generally make about the same amount of money as that famous author. You'll make it on the back end instead of on the front end. And these numbers do change slightly, but a lot of co publishing uh, contract language is the s has been the same for years. And basically, the percentages are around the same for everyone. It's just how many books do you sell. And so because of that, you, you are kind of insulated against this sort of, um, if your book takes off, you haven't just sold it for $10,000. If your book takes off and sells a million copies, you're going to make five million bucks on that book, regardless if you are a brand new author or not. At least if you have an industry standard contract, which all the big publishers should be offering as boilerplate, you should be making a certain percentage, which I don't think we have time to talk about this week, but we'll try to get in next week. But one of the things to know about advance is the more money the publisher has paid up front, the more likely they are to be like, man, we need to push this book because 
we spent 200 grand on the advance for this. And if we only sell 10,000 copies, we're not gonna make our money back. So we better give it a huge marketing campaign. So generally the bigger your advance, the better within reason. Uh, there is one reason that sometimes it's bad to have a big advance. Um, and that is if you can imagine two books, one of which both of these books are gonna sell uh, 50,000 copies. One of these books, they paid a $10,000 advance on, and it sold 50,000 copies. And so off of that, the author's earning around 150 grand, maybe 200 grand, depending on paperback, stuff like that, whatever. Um, but you know, 50,000 in hardcover uh, would be around usually three to four bucks a book. Um, this other book, they paid $2 million for. It sells 50,000 uh, 50, copies suddenly this book is a flop and this one is a huge surprise success selling the same number of copies so there is an argument for what my agent will always call and say here's where it seems like everyone is settling that this book is worth pushing them higher than this may not be a good idea because they all have instincts about what it'll sell it's all made up instincts no one knows for sure what you'll sell but there is that little caveat that i know joshua likes it when i put in there to mention why sometimes pushing the, uh, the advance astronomically high may not be a great idea. Um, but regardless, this book has, an advance has been made, your agent negotiates. Generally, you want to have a contract where you're selling more than one book. Um, you don't generally want to sell a dozen books uh, because you want to be able to renegotiate, but you also want them committed to trying to grow you as an author. So for instance, they offered on Elantris, they offered $10,000 for one book. Joshua, you know, they offered $5,000 for one book. Joshua got them argued up to $20,000 for two books. So 10,000 per book for two different books. Um, and said, let's go with this. Uh, he feels like he could have taken it other places and got higher, he still thinks that. But since I'd already off, I wanted to be at Tor and I'd send it to Tor already and I'm like, I think we should be at Tor. I took a slightly lower advance than Joshua thought we probably could have got if we would have played the field a little bit more. Um, so the book has been negotiated, all the terms get negotiated. Uh, we'll talk about contracts next week. And at that point, you start working directly with the editor. If it's not the acquisitions editor, it's uh, generally, it's going to be the person who ended up negotiating for the book the most. Sometimes it's not, sometimes it's handed off to a different editor. Either way, this is the person that you're going to have a great relationship with, hopefully. This is the person who's the project manager for your book. Their job is to find out from, you know, talk with you about how to make the book better. They always want to make a better version of the book you want to write. Remember that they bought your book. They're not gonna try to push it to be something it's not, okay? They'll wanna help you make it a better version of itself. People ask, do editors ask for things to be added? Only if they think it's going to make a better version of the book that you are trying to write. They will make suggestions. It's always your job to make the changes and to decide if you want them or not. At the end of the day, you can always pay back the advance and cancel the contract um, if it doesn't end up working out. That happens very rarely. Most of the time, you work with the editor, you, give, you, you try the things they suggest, some of the things they suggest you really like, some you don't. You come to a uh, kind of consensus at the end of the book is now ready. The editor, meantime, has been working with the art director to come up with a, uh, with a cover. Your cover is a movie poster for your book. It is not an illustration of your book. Right, So the uh, art director's job is to come up with a cover that will get the right audience to pick up your book, not to be detail accurate to what's in the book. Keep that in mind. Editor handles that. They will show you sketches. They usually will not let you have too much influence over the cover as a new author. Sometimes they will, most of the time they won't. At that point then, they take it out and give it to their sales force. The sales force takes it around and sells it to all the, um, the markets, all the bookstores, and says, you should buy the, carry this number of copies. It's a really important, cool book that we're releasing. They come up with negotiations and deals and things like that about releasing the book into the stores. And then they do publicity, which is money they um, put into the author's tour and things like that. And they do marketing, which is money they put into convincing the booksellers to push the book. And at that point, your book gets released. We'll do more questions about this um, in two weeks because next week we'll do another publishing lecture and then we'll do a lot of your questions. So students, make sure you fill out the form. Make sure you write questions I didn't get to in that form and I'll try to get to it in two weeks. Uh, next week we'll do indie publishing and contracts, all right? <sighs> Sorry about the fire hose, guys. 
Sorry about the late start, but keep going, keep writing. We'll, we'll see you again next week.